Hello and welcome to this webinar on eco-design eco working plans, um, originally given on the 19th of June. My name is Fiona Brocklehurst from Ballarat Consulting. Um, I'm going to use in this webinar eco-design as a shorthand for the eco-design of energy related products directive, which I hope you agree is reasonable because that's rather a lot of words to get out. Um, the directive is one of the main instruments within the EU to achieve energy efficiency and most of the effort in terms of regulation has focused on um, energy energies, aspects of it, um, but it can go beyond that and there is the potential to reduce other environmental impacts. So what am I going to be talking about today? The um, webinar is going to be in two parts. The first part is an introduction to um, the overall directive and to the process of developing the working plans. Um, and as part of that, we'll look at the eco-design product criteria. In the second part, we'll look in the detail as the actual working plans, what's happened so far. Um, and because most some of the activity that's happening at the moment is about reviewing early regulations, um, I'll just briefly look into those two. So starting with part one, the introduction and the process. What is the Eco-Design Directive? It was originally introduced 10 years ago now, um, in 2005, as Eco-Design of Energy Using Products Directive. It was recast in 2009 to look at energy-related products. So that was expanding the coverage to include products that influence energy use, such as windows, tires, and insulation. Um, the reason the, it's called the Eco Design Directive and the focus on the design aspect is because it's thought that most, by far the most um, impacts are determined through the design phase. So if you put effort into improving the design, that will have a very, that will be a very effective way of reducing the impact over the whole of the product's life. And just kind of developing that theme, um, a lot of countries such as the USA, Australia and China have minimum energy performance standards or MEPS. These look at the energy consumption in use of a product. Um, Eco Design seeks to go beyond that. It looks at the energy consumption in use, but it also looks at other parts of the life cycle. So um, at uh, manufacture and distribution and so on. It also looks at these other aspects, so how much and what materials get used, um, water consumption, what gets emitted, um, hazardous contents and waste aspects. So it's trying to look at the whole product in every aspect, not just energy in use. So who is involved within the European Commission on eco design? And the responsibility is between these two Directorate Generals, DG Energy and DG Growth, which was formerly DG Enterprise and Industry. Uh, DG Environment is also involved in some ways, um, but on a more, but they, the two leads are those two. So this is a diagram of the eco design process, quite a lot of which is relevant to the working plan, so I'm going to talk through it in a certain amount of detail. So the first, once the um, working plan is in place, the top left there, we have um, um, the DGs initiate a preparatory study, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail on the next slide. An important thing to notice about that is that there's a lot of stakeholder consultation in the course of that preparatory study. Um, and then in the next phase in the consultation forum, so there's a lot of opportunity for um, different partners, parties to put forward their views, provide information and so on. Um, the consultation forum consists of member state representatives, industry not directly but via trade associations, um, and NGOs, both environmental and, and consumer NGOs are um, represented. They consider the draft implementing measure um, which is put forward by the Commission 
and they make a comment on it. That may then be revised by the Commission. It may go through for one round. When we have a, a draft implementing measure, which is then voted on in regulatory committee by member state representatives, um, considered by Parliament, and then all being well adopted. The preparatory study, the first step, is an important part of the process, but doesn't set the um, agenda completely. The regulation is very rarely directly what comes out of the preparatory study, so there is um, it's refined in the process of this by the Commission themselves on there and their consultees, um, mostly via the consultation forum. Um, it's a long process. If you look at the top there, it says 51 to 52 months, so that's considerably more than four years. Um, and in some cases, some products, it can take quite a lot longer than that. For example, um, the preparatory study for domestic boilers was completed in 2007. And the regulation was adopted in, t in September 2013. So um, that was a particularly complex case, but it, it can take a long time. Um, generally, there's a year from adoption of the regulation by um, the com Commission to when it starts to take effect, so that there is further time for industry and so on to adapt to what's happening. And the regulations often have tiers in them, so they become more um, demanding, more, more requiring more energy efficiency over time. Um, I should also say that there are a number of the products that have ecodesign re regulation also have energy labeling regulation. Um, and that process is in parallel with this. So in terms of the working plans goes through the first part of this process too. So there is a, a study undertaken by a consultant in place of the preparatory study. And then that is um, a working plan is put forward based on the information in that by the commission. And then that's considered by the consultation forum before the working plans are adopted. OK. So what happens in the preparatory study is there is a standard methodology. So it's done in a consistent way. And I'm talking about this because the same basic approach is also used for the working plan studies. So you have um, a first look. You consider different aspects and um, put forward um, um, recommendations or scenarios. So the, the methodology has supporting it um, a standardized spreadsheet so that, again, you get consistency between estimating what the impacts are. So moving on, why do we need a working plan? I'm not going to talk about this um, but quite complicated diagram in any detail. It shows basically the amount of energy consumption by the different type of use and um, also the number of products involved. So you can see, just as a sort of snapshot, we're talking potentially about thousands of products. Um, and in order to make good use of resources and regulate appropriately, we need to prioritize and decide what needs to be done first. So how do we select which products um, get covered, or what products are basically covered by the ecodesign reduction? And the, the guide criteria for selection, and these are not um, hard and fast rules are that there needs to be significant volumes of sales and trade, that there needs to be significant impact and the scope, the final point, to reduce that. Um, so we also need to think about are these these products are also covered by or are these products also covered by other existing policy and are they adequately covered or do, does more need to be done? So we need to we don't want to have gaps in our coverage and we also don't want to have the same thing um, covered by more than more than one policy overlapping, which can cause confusion and is obviously not efficient. And again, just to give a picture of what's involved in that, um, here's um, a sort of mapping 
of product policies in the EU. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail, but it shows that there is a number of product groups where there's a lot of overlap, and um, they need the pro the policies need to work together to give an effective result. The other thing beyond the environmental is the products that you have at the end of it, and they need to work. They still need to do what um, customers need them to do. Um, so that's functionality and health and safety, and they need to be affordable. They also, industry still needs to be able to make enough profit from manufacturing these products um, and supplying them and selling them to stay in business. So competitiveness is also a consideration. Um, one of the risks is imposing a particular technology that's owned by one company. That's not acceptable. It needs to be something that anyone can buy into. Um, and you don't want to impose excessive administration on manufacturers. So it's just some common sense aspects that um, aren't unusual or strange, but they just need to be kept hold of in the process. So what is the process of uh, a working plan study um, in sort of outline? First of all, you list eligible products, and part of that is taking account what's already been covered, and as I've discussed, what's already covered by existing regulation. You do an initial look to look at the those three sort of key criteria: the volume of sales, the resource consumption or in, environmental impact, and the scope for improvement. Um, generally speaking, the initial sift is looking at the energy use in operation, um, partly because that's the biggest impact often, but also because that's often the most accessible data. So you have a reasonable chance of finding it and being confident, some confidence as to what it means. Um, so then you take the top layer of that, as it were, the suitable and high product, high priority product policies, and look um, in more detail. Um, you look for, again, the, the policy overlap or policies that might be relevant um, and the scope for improvement. And that um, methodology that I mentioned for the um, preparatory studies, um, that's used as a basis, though not in as much detail. And then as a final step, you draw up a list um, which will be ranked on the improvement potential, which is then the sort of starting point for a formal commission to look at what they want to include in the working plan. So to illustrate this, and again, I'm not going to go into any detail, this is the example from the most recent working plan study. Um, and it shows you the most important thing I want you to pick out of this is, is how the number of products that are looked at at the different phases gets reduced to something from something quite um, extensive to something more manageable. So by the end, um, in task four, you're talking about 20 products, um, which is something that people can deal with and manage. So some observations from having been only an observer, an outsider on these studies. I haven't been involved in them directly. Um, but I think the, a key point it to, to bring up is that this really isn't a precise process. Um, the first sort of step of categorizing product groups is difficult. So that in itself is quite a challenge. They need to be broad enough to have an impact, but narrow enough that they, their feasibility is sort of consistent. Um, and they need to be consistent enough with existing categorizations out there, such as PRODCOM, for collecting sales and trades data. Um, and ideally, using information that you can find in existing um, life cycle analyses. So ideally, your categories want to be mutually exclusive, but also exhaustive, so that you're trying to cover everything without overlap. Um, but there is, so that's your first step. And then, <laughs> then you have to get data on a lot of different aspects, um, which can be quite a challenge. 
um, particularly for origin and materials or um, what happens to the waste stream. Um, a challenge that comes up quite often is that there aren't existing test standards for the energy in use, for example. So how can you judge the potential to improve when you haven't got consistent measurement of um, the energy in use? Um, as you move away from products that are already regulated one way or another in some country or another, that gets more difficult. So um, basically, as we've gone through the working plans, that has become the, the process of drawing, doing the studies and drawing them up has become um, more challenging. Um, and then this is something that will be very familiar with people who work in a life cycle analysis. How do you balance very different criteria? So if a product, um, for example, has a particular waste issue but is good in energy in use, um, how do you balance that against a product which is um, has lots of potential to cut down energy in use but, but doesn't have the waste issue? Um, there's no easy way out of that. You just have to um, try and make a sensible argument. And you also need to bear in mind if the regular how if a regulation would be feasible. So it's partly about um, how do you how would you enforce it? How would you tell that people are uh, following that? And um, real data and real experience from stakeholders is crucial in all this, helping to address missing data, um, helping for the whole thing to be robust and realistic. That may be um, component manufacturers or um, importers as well as manufacturers who operate in the UK.